Question for you. Would you consider yourself gifted? Would you consider yourself to be talented? Now, I used to, I used to work with a fellow. He was a good friend of mine. He has since died of, of sarcoma, uh, a type of cancer. But he was, I would say he was talented, at least in some way. He was entertaining talented. He was a salesman long, long uh, with myself in the company I worked for, and he could, he, whenever we'd have a function or something, he'd always do some, some interesting things. He could juggle, he could whistle, and sound like just about any kind of a bird, or make sounds like a cat and a bird fighting, or, or a lot of different things. He could, he could dance like the song goes. He could sing, he could dance, he could play the harmonica too, and that was probably pretty much him. He could do that. And some people have a lot of talent like that, or are gifted in physical ways, in, in those kinds of ways. And he was. And it was always appreciated. He, he'd always, at, at uh, large gatherings, he'd always have a group of uh, young children around him because he was doing all kind of magic tricks with cards and pulling his finger off and making it look like he lost his finger and all kind of different things. So, so he was talented. There are special shows about gifted and talented people, people who can do things that it's almost impossible to imagine that people could do. I don't know if you've ever seen Cirque du Soleil or in some of those um, types of events, but there are people that can bend over backwards and look out between their legs, which seems like it would be physically, humanly impossible. There are many uh, people, I say many, as a percentage of the population, it's not many, but there are many people who can do gifted, talented things like that, those types of things. There are even classes for people who are gifted to um, not probably so much in that type of way, but maybe they're gifted in math or maybe they're gifted in uh, biology or, or some of the, the sciences and so forth. We have amazing athletes, people that give you a couple. For example, Pete Rose, they called him the hit king. He was a um, baseball player for the Cincinnati Reds, and I can't remember, maybe I should have looked it up when he retired, but he's retired now, and of course, you might remember he was a little bit disgraced because they claimed he betted on, bet on um, uh, the game of baseball, and so they wouldn't let him in the Hall of Fame, but he is the leader in hits all time with 4,256 hits. It's a lot of hits. It's baseball, or safe hits. They, they say, they being whoever. <laughs> but anyway, the, the claim has been made that hitting a round sphere with a round stick is one of the most difficult feats in all of sports. And especially when that round sphere is coming at you at 90 miles an hour or even 95, and it's not coming in a straight line, it's moving. It's hard to hit. And I can see that it would be. But he had uh, developed such a knack for it that he got the all-time hit le leadership with 4,256. And I calculated if every one of those was a single, which it wasn't. He had, had doubles and triples and home runs too, but mostly he had singles. But if everyone was just a single, it's 90 feet from home plate to first base. He would have had 383,040 feet of running to first base. That's, that is 72 and a half miles of running just to, from home to first. Nadia Kamenichi, some of you right, rem, might remember her as well. She was a famous Romanian gymnast. When she was 14 years old, she was the first gymnast to have a perfect 10 score. All, I think it's four judges, I believe is what it is, gave her a perfect score of 10, and that was the first time that it happened. I, I can still see them on the balance beam, and that's the thing that always makes me cringe, because I'm thinking they'll come down and miss it and, and twist an ankle or break an ankle and fall off and hurt themselves, but somehow they manage most of them not to do that. I don't know if I've ever seen 
more than one or two actually fall off of it, but a few of them now and then do. We have very inspiring artists that can inspire us with the paintings they do. Michelangelo took four years to paint the Sistine Chapel, the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Leonardo da Vinci, who did the Mona Lisa and a lot of other famous paintings, and very, some of them very inspiring, he was a great artist. Frederick Remington, who was a cowboy painter, he painted the Old West in vivid detail and he was very, very good at it. Moving musicians, there was a girl and I was trying to find her name and I can't seem to remember her name. We saw her play the violin in Canton with the Canton Symphony a number of years ago, might have been about 10 years ago. She was very good, but the reason I went was not necessarily to see her play. She was playing a, an authentic, genuine Stradivarius violin. A, a, an investor owned it and he had let her borrow it to go on the road to play because he said, after all, violins were made to be played. And, and it's true, they are. But she, uh, I would have been worried about it because she stowed it in the luggage compartment overhead on the plane. And I would have been worried that somebody would make off with it, but she wasn't. It was, I think, insured for a million dollars, I believe. And she was great, very good. Another one, a blind guitar player from uh, Lenore, North Carolina. His name is Doc Watson. And he may be the greatest flat pick guitar player. And flat picking is just to have a pick as opposed to your finger style. And, but he was one of the greatest guitar players, acoustic flat pick guitar players of all time. Very good. He died of, in 2003 maybe early 2000 he died, but um, he was exceptionally good. All of those people, very, very talented, extremely talented. Compared to these, we could feel just a little bit insignificant when it comes to talent. Now, maybe some of you are in that class, I don't know. Uh, if you are, you probably haven't let us know about it. but. Nonetheless, th those are some very talented people and it makes, could make us, if we compared ourselves to that standard, it could make our, us feel pretty insignificant, pretty um, insufficient maybe as it were. In fact, and we'll turn to 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, Paul writing here, says the church in Corinth. 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, and Paul again writing to the Corinthians and, and he was writing them a letter uh, to trying to help them in their journey in their Christian walk so to speak in their discipleship and he says in verse 26 it sa he says you see your calling that not many wise according to the flesh not many mighty and not many noble are called in fact, that's, you know, that's sort of a body punch there to us uh, when, you, when you look at that and, and so forth. But he said, in fact, God has chosen the foolish. So we, if we're called, perhaps we're in that group, or the weak, or in verse 28, he has called the base, which means insignificant of the world. He has not called the mighty. He has not called the noble. And he's not called the wise, generally speaking, at this point in time or at this time. He is called the base, the weak, and the foolish, as it says here. Which, if, if we are called, which we are and profess to be and claim to be and hope to be, if that's the case, then we probably would be in that group. But yet, don't let that get you down. Uh, Romans, notice Romans the 12th chapter, just back a couple of pages in my Bible. Romans the 12th chapter. Gives a little bit different story, and we will explore all these things a little bit more as we go along. In verse 6, we're just going to look at verse 6 right now. 
It says in verse 6, having, and again, he's, he's speaking to the Romans. Romans verse 12, he said in the first uh, verse, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable God, to God, which is your reasonable service. But here he says in verse 6, having then gifts, and he's talking to the called. Having gifts, so this is a little paints a little different picture than we read about in 1 Corinthians, the first chapter in verse 26. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given he said, to us, he said, let us use them. So again, I pose the question, are we gifted? Are we talented? Do we think so? And if so, why? In fact, I've titled my message today, The Gifted. The Gifted. And we're going to look at a couple of examples that could help us understand this particular issue of the gifted. And, and that would help us to uh, uh, have a broader, better knowledge of it. Now, one of the first places, and you might have thought of this already, that we're going to go to is in Matthew, the 25th chapter. Matthew 24 usually gets all the, all the, the uh, attention because it's a, it's a great chapter on, on prophetic events and, uh, you know, the step-by-step -step things that are going to unfold in the future along with um, uh, Revel the book of Revelation and reading in Daniel and so forth. Matthew 24 is right up there with all of, all of those and maybe at the top of the list because Jesus Christ himself gave us Matthew 24. But in, uh, in uh, Matthew, the 25th chapter, we're just going to read verse 14 and 15. These are, or this is, a preparation for the kingdom of God parable. It's a preparation for the kingdom of God parable. Now, we're preparing for the Feast of Tabernacles right now, which is almost synonymous with the, with the kingdom of God because of what it represents and what we've come to learn about it. But here, in verse 14 of chapter 25, it says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country. Now, that sounds sort of odd. How could the kingdom of heaven be like a man traveling to a far country? But that's what it says here. Who called his own servants, this of course was before he left for the far country, and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability. And then he left immediately. It said he went on a journey. He, he left and went away. As I said, this is a kingdom of God parable an analogy for the kingdom of God, but it's actually a preparation for the kingdom of God. Just as we're preparing to go to the feast in about a month, it's what's today the fifth, we'll actually be in our, our uh, second or third day of the feast already in a month from now, but just as we're preparing to go to the feast, we're also preparing at the same time for the kingdom of God. That's our job. And as it says in Leviticus, the 23, 23rd chapter, in uh, verse 43, the reason we do it is so that we may know. So that we may know. We're, we're doing this and keeping the Feast of Tabernacles for, in fact, let's just turn back there so we can read it in the context. Leviticus 23, verse 43. That's, if you remember, Leviticus is the play, 23 is the place where all the feasts are listed. It's the only place in the Old Testament where all the feasts are treated in such a complete manner as they are here. There, there are other places where they're mentioned, there are other places where they're listed, but here it gives a little bit more detail. But in verse, uh, we'll, we'll look at verse 42. It says, you shall dwell in booths for seven days. And then in verse 43, that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel to dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. 
and there, there in verse 43 at the beginning is what it says, that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel to dwell in Booth when I brought them out of Egypt. That's one of the primary reasons, but, the, but it goes into further detail as we get a chance to begin to learn more about the Feast of Tabernacles. And many of us here have been, of course, in the church for a long time, so we've probably been to a number of feasts, and we have a pretty good idea of what the Feast of Tabernacles represents because we've been there enough. So again, simultaneously, as we are preparing for the Feast of Tabernacles, we are also preparing for the kingdom of God. We're working on those things that we need to be doing to make sure that we are ready for the kingdom of God. There are many, many um, scriptures that tell us about that, like, for example, in, in verse, uh, or in chapter 25 of Matthew, the first, about the ten virgins. They, not all of them were prepared when the time came. So that's what we're trying to prevent here as we get ready for the feast and as we also get ready for the kingdom of God. Now, regarding that we may know that the, uh, your generations in the future may know, as it said there in Leviticus, the uh, 23rd chapter, Paul goes even a step further in 1 Corinthians 10. We don't need to necessarily go there. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 11. And he lists from the beginning there, he lists starting at the Red Sea and crossing the Red Sea, all, some of the different things that happened all the way up to where the bodies, it says, were scattered all across the wilderness. And they were getting ready to go into the promised land. But in verse 11, he says, these, thing, these things were all examples for us so that me, we may learn not to do the things that they did. In fact, again, let's just go there real quick. 1 Corinthians 10, that way we can read it. And in verse 11, it says, All these things happened to them, that being the children of Israel. It, it leads up to this by saying what all they did and what all they a few of the things that happened to them along the way. It says, all these things happened to them as examples, and they are written for our admonition, which means for our instruction, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. This is for our admonition also means training. For our training by the word. These are written so that we don't have to make the same mistakes that they made and the same things that they fell into. So it's the roots that we're going into here, even in the feast, for the Feast of Tabernacles, go all the way back to the Exodus. That's where it all started. That whole experience, the Exodus experience was for our instructions so we can be better at it. So we don't have to, you know, those who, who um, fail to heed the, the uh, history are doomed to repeat the mistakes that were made in history. So we can actually look at these things and we don't have to make the same mistakes that they made. We don't have to. Too often maybe we do, but again, this is written so that we don't have to. We can see what happened and we can avoid those things. We're gonna go in a little bit more or greater detail as I mentioned about this. And that is, we're going to look at a couple of examples, one in the Bible, one's not from the Bible, but it's a, it's a, a, a human example, a historical example of things that happened and how they were dealt with that can help us to not make those mistakes and not squander our gifts, the gifts that we have. We um, have been hearing all the way back to Passover and on beyond, and all the way up to now, we've been hearing about a lot from the book of Exodus, and we're gonna to go to the book of Exodus again today. We've been hearing about the travels 
of the children of Israel, starting out from the land of Egypt, crossing the Red Sea, and heading out into the wilderness, and then coming up to Mount Sinai, or Sinai, I'm sorry, Mount Sinai, and um, I, I was thinking of the little cute little thing, uh, I think it was a first grader or something, they asked them to write something about the Bible, and he said, well, Moses led the, the um, he didn't call them the children of Israel, but he, he led the, uh, some group of people out to Mount Sinai, and uh, that's, that's probably about what uh, a lot of people know about it. it. They don't know a whole lot about it. But anyway, they, as they approached Mount Sinai, they camped in front of the mountain, and there is where the biggest events happened to them. The Red Sea crossing was also just as big uh, in their minds probably because it was a gravity and, and physical impossibility, gravity-defying event. But here, this was an event of another sort. Here, they were confronted or they saw God. When I say they saw God, they saw the effects of God. They saw the glory of God. The mountain was on a smoke and it was on, on fire, so to speak. It was an awesome sight. And they, it was so awesome that they actually said, no, we're, we'd like to, you go, Moses, we'll just stay back, which is what they ended up doing. So Moses went up on the mountain, obviously, and he was up there for 40 days. But what happened up there was the beginnings or the instructions or the command for one of the greatest projects in the history of mankind that was given by God. That project was to build a dwelling place on earth, a sanctuary for God Almighty. To build a sanctuary for God to dwell in with his people. And the God of the Old Testament, of course, was Jesus Christ, which uh, 1 Corinthians 10 here says that it was the rock, the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. It, it uh, explains it fairly thoroughly. But this, I say this was the greatest challenge be, uh, for a project because the temple was a tremendous challenge too. But with the temple, there were a lot more resources available than there were here. This is a group of slaves, maybe a million and a half, two million, maybe over two million strong, that were out in no man's land, and they did not have the resources that they had in Solomon's day when the temple was being built. They had, um, if you wanted to do something, you had to do it pretty much all by hand, and when I say by hand, you might have a few hand tools, and that's about it. By the time of Solomon, they had a lot more resources to throw at the building the temple than they did at the tabernacle in the wilderness. And that's why I say it was a, one of the greatest projects undertaken that is described in the Bible, the building of the tabernacle. Not that the temple wasn't a great, in great detail. It was. It was, it was very beautiful, the temple that Solomon built, and a lot of resources were accounted for there. Most of these things are all described and we'll spend a little bit of time back there. In Exodus, the 25th chapter, it's mostly described between Exodus 25 and the end of Exodus, which is Exodus 40. And it goes into a great amount or great detail on what is to be constructed. If we were thinking of building a house for God, a dwelling place on earth for God, in your imagination, what would you do? If you didn't have the instructions for it, what would you do? How would you do it? Well, fortunately for them, God gave them the details on what to do. He told them to the minute details what to do. For example, and there were six, it was so important that he gave them 16 chapters worth of, uh, in 
not all details, but first of all, you got the details of what they're supposed to do. Then, of course, in the middle of that, you had the golden calf incident, which sort of arrested it for a little bit and had to be reset. But then after that, in, in beginning in chapter 35, I think, it uh, describes how the tabernacle was built. The first part tells you how it was supposed to be built, and the second part, how it was built. In Exodus, the 25th chapter, and starting, well, the first uh, seven verses is a materials list. And now we can see, if we read through the first seven, we won't read through it, but there's a lot of things, silver, gold, bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, lin fine linen, goat's hair, ram. And I was thinking of that when I read goat's hair. Um, what would you do with a bag full of goat's hair? Well, they did things with it. We'll get to that in a minute. But uh, these things were probably mostly, and we can probably now see a little bit with a little bit more clarity, why they, the, they spoiled the Egyptians. God had something in mind and a purpose and a reason for it beyond just for them. Because what, after all, how much gold can you spend out in the wilderness where there's nothing to buy? And most of these things would have been of some value, but not a great deal of value in the wilderness as you're traveling, as they ended up doing. Obviously, they didn't think it was going to be this long, but it ended up being 40 years. But nonetheless, he gave them a long list, included different stones, included planks of acacia wood, which nobody is quite sure what acacia wood is, but apparently it's something that insects do not tend to attack and is also very rot resistant. So uh, apparently it was some kind of wood that was pretty durable and was not going to be affected by the environment around them. Of course, in that area it was probably pretty dry, so uh, rotting was not as big an issue as it would in a damp climate or a humid climate. But this is the big list of what they had. Then in verse 8, it says why that the, these were things that they collected from those who had a willing heart, as it says in verse 2, everyone who gives it, it willingly with his heart you shall take an offering from. Then in verse 8 it says, And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. They are to build a sanctuary, and this sanctuary is for God. This is a we'll call it a house for God, not in the sense of the temple, but in another type of dwelling place for God. It's a tabernacle, and it's one of the reasons why we celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles included in this. It was temporary, it was movable, and it was the dwelling place for God among his people when they were in the wilderness. It was pretty, a pretty important project, wouldn't you say? If we were building that, let's say we were building a house for God, whether it be a temple or whether uh, some building, a church building, and we deemed it to be a house for God. When we worked on it, I would dare say that we would be pretty particular. We would be pretty proud of our work, and we would try to make sure that our work was of the very highest quality, as high as it could be. I have, and, and it always, I'm always reminded of some of these things, I have a picture on my wall. It's not a, it's a painting on my wall. And it is a painting of the children of Israel in the wilderness. In the center of it is the tabernacle and then the courtyard out around it. And then beyond that, are thousands and hundreds of thousands of little tabernacles, tents, temporary dwellings. And I always ask myself, where did all those tents come from? I know there weren't no, there weren't, no, that's not very correct English. There weren't any stores like Cabela, or Cabela's around to go buy order tents from. So, they left on foot 600,000 men plus children and much cattle and herds, or much herds and flocks is actually what it says. 
And if they had 600,000 men on foot, they would probably need 600,000 tents or more, depending on how many there were in a tent. Maybe, some, maybe not all of those lived in different tents, but they'd still need five, four, five, six hundred thousand tents to cover all those people. And that's what this picture I have sort of portrays. You see the pillar of fire coming up from the tabernacle, and then there's a cloud, and the light spreads out over the cloud, so it gives, illuminates the encampment at night to sun. It's like a night light, so to speak, so that people could see. But as far as the eye could see in every direction, pretty much, there were tents. And it brings, the thing that it does, it brings home the scope of that project, how many it was. You, you, you think, well, a bunch of people wandering around in the wilderness, but we've, we're talking about a lot of people, a lot of real estate that is covered at all times by the Israelites, by the 12 tribes of Israel. A lot more than we might think of just casually thinking about it. But I, that was my question for a long time. Where did all those tents come from? Maybe we can answer that. So Moses was up on Mount Sinai in Exodus 25, and he was commissioned to build a dwelling place with, with um, the people, the Israelites, to help to build a dwelling place for God. And in verse 9 here, if we're still in Exodus 25, verse 9, <coughs> excuse me, says, you're to make it according to all that I show you. That is the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furnishings. Just so you shall make it. So it wasn't left to to decide, you know, well, we want to take a shortcut here, we're going to make it like that there, and so on. He told them exactly how to make it. And he didn't just tell them, he showed him. I, I sort of envisioned that he, <clears throat> it, it, it was a replica of the throne of God to begin with to some extent, but I'm, I'm thinking that he showed him a model of it. That, so that, because when you read through here, and you can read it in about any translation you want. It's difficult, even with all the dimensions and everything you have, to envision exactly how all these things are to be done. And I, I have, I do some, um, for my work, I do some store layouts. And it's hard for me to do those store layouts. And what it is, it's um, uh, when somebody builds a new store, I, I try to help them with where things go where the shelving goes and where product goes and where the deli goes and all those kind of things. But until I go out there, and that's why I sometimes travel, until I go out there and actually look at the project for myself, it's hard to visualize that. It's hard to quite grasp everything in three dimension of what they're talking about or how, they, how they're going about this. So when I go out there and I get a good glimpse or a good picture of it, then it makes it a lot easier. And I'm, visual, I'm, I'm envisioning that that's what happened here to Moses, that he had a replica or some kind of a model, or maybe he was transferred in, in, a, in a vision somewhere, and he saw what this was all supposed to look like. Then he could come back, and with all these dimensions and everything he had, he could build what he had seen. So I'm guessing that's what, it, what sort of what this was like. And... He, the first thing it says that he was, and it starts in verse 10, we won't read much of it, but it starts in verse 10 of uh, chapter 25, and you shall make the ark, and that would be the ark of the covenant, you're supposed to make it a certain way. That's the first thing. Now, he gives dimensions, and they're given in cupids, or cubits, not cupids, cubits, uh, C-U-B-I-T-S. A, a cubit is approximately 18 inches. And what it was, it was the, from the, from the um, elbow to the tip of your middle finger. And I measured mine, I think it was 17 point something uh, inches. And that's for the average man, it's around, or person, it's around 18 inches. And that's basically what a cupid supposedly is based on. And that's what they used to build all this. And I'll just give you the list of things that they were to make. 
there were 12 things that were listed, and all of these things had accompanying tools and, and paraphernalia that went with, first of all, the tabernacle it's it overall. But second thing, the Ark of the Testimony, which is, is mentioned here. And the Ark of the Testimony was made to extremely exacting, exacting um, details. It was made with acacia wood, and then it was covered with, with uh, gold, solid gold. And the thing was, you couldn't just take gold and piece it together. It had to be hammered out into one solid piece of gold all around, which is not that easy to do. And then it had to have staves covered with gold, and it had to have rings on the side of it to carry it with. And these gold-covered staves would go through the rings, and then they had certain of the tribes of Israel that would carry these, sort of like, um, maybe it's not the greatest analogy, but sort of like a coffin would be uh, carried because it has rails on the side to hang on, to, to hold on to, and, and then people carry it. But you're out in the desert or um, in the wilderness, and you're asked to make a ring. And that ring has to be perfect, but you don't, all you have to make it with basically is hammers. Now you have, you know, you can get something round or make possibly something round and, and uh, hammer it out, make, take a solid piece, put a hole in it. We used to take a, uh, we used to make rings, finger rings, out of pennies. I don't know if any of you ever did that, but we'd punch a hole with a nail through the center of the penny, and then the nail was on the inside, and then you'd put it on an anvil, and you'd just keep tapping all around it, and it would become flat, and you could get it uh, the more you tap, the larger it got. You put it on things to make it large. It would get larger, so finally you could make a ring out of it and slip it on your finger. And that's how I envisioned that they would have done rings, something like that, a gold piece of gold, and then they started hammering it. But these were all little tiny details that had to be done, the ark. Then the mercy seat was put on top of the ark, and the, the cherubim were hammered, and they were placed over the are uh, uh, on top of the ark, and their wings would almost touch each other, and that's where God would meet them underneath there. Then they had to make furnishings and furniture for the tabernacle, t um, a lot of a lot of different things, tables, utensils. They had to make the gold lampstand, and the gold lampstand again was all of one piece. It was like a candelabra. It had the stand. Then it had three candle holders on each side so that it would have six uh, candles on the whole candelabra. It was solid gold. The altar of incense. Now the altar of incense and the altar of burnt offering, they were made with a bronze covering. They made a laver in its base. The laver in its base were like a big uh, water bowl so that the priests could wash when they, they had to wash when they came into the the holy place, they had to wash so that they would be clean ceremonially, ceremonially, if I can say it right. And all of these things had to be perfect, and it was all done by hand. It was not done, you know, in a machine shop with micrometers and all the different things that we have today. This was done in the wilderness, and they didn't have probably the kind of workshops we do today. I'm not sure if they took some of the acacia wood and made platforms possibly like tables or, or benches to make things on. I'm guessing that's the kind of thing they did, but it wasn't like it is when we can do it in our workshop. Then on, they made the garments for the ministry, which was another big job because the priest, the high priest, had to wear certain things um, with uh, special adornments that they used to go in with the, tw the stones engraved with the 12 names of the 12 tribes. I think it were six on a side, 12 tribes of Israel with their names on it and so on. So it wasn't, it, there were a lot of things. The curtains had to be embroidered with uh, carabum or pomegranates, I believe, on them and different flowers. The 
some of the furniture had to make be made with carved flowers on them and knobs and and so forth. So it wasn't just plain. This, this was very ornate and very detailed. Then they had to make the the anointing oil, and they had a special uh, list or a recipe of spices to make the anointing oil with, and the sweet incense the same way. And these, the ingredients are given, but on on the the um, penalty of death you couldn't make those for yourself this is the one and only use for these things all of those things and wow they had to be in detail one piece of gold or bronze screens curtains tent the veil the cherubim the sockets the clasps the rings all of those things had to be made just so the right size to the right specifications and perfect every all of those so the problem is you're in the wilderness you're out here the challenge is people to do these things artisans is what they were called how do you get people to do these things it's not easy if we go somewhere we want to hire a specialist we put an ad in the paper and we get people that are trained through schools technical schools all kinds of universities and and uh, trade schools and so forth that are that are uh, trained in the things we want to do that know exactly how to do all these things that know exactly how to read blueprints that know exactly how how to machine intricate details of, of parts. We know John Miller has a machine shop and that's what he does. But he doesn't just go out on the street and grab somebody and say, hey, come on in here and make this little part for me. He gets specialized people. That's what machine shops, that's what uh, furniture builders, and that, that's what technical and detailed companies have to do. They have to get qualified people. But who are, where were these? These were slaves. Where do you get trained and qualified people to do the work that God is requiring here? Well, turn on over to chapter 31. Of Exodus. Chapter 31 says of Exodus, and we'll read from one to, to six. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, and here's where he was getting his people to work. I have called by, by name Bezalel, the son of Uriah, the son of Hur of the tribe of Judah, and have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom, in understanding, in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship to design artistic works to work in gold and silver and bronze, in cutting jewels for setting and carving wood and to work in all manner of workmanship. There's a place we go to, it's called P. Graham Dunn. It's down in uh, uh, Wayne County on Route 30. And they do some amazing laser cutting, carvings. They make some really beautiful uh, artistic work. But they have machines to do that, to cut all those things out. They did not have machines to do this, so they had to have people who were qualified. Verse 6, And I, ha I, I indeed, I have appointed with him Aholiab, the son of Ahisamach, of the tribe of Dan, and I have put wisdom in the hearts of all the gifted artisans, that they may make all that I have commanded you. These, these things God was providing for, but we're going to go a little further than that. In verse uh, 25 of, of chapter 35, chapter 35 of Exodus, we're going to go a little bit deeper here. Chapter 25 says, he, he called uh, uh, Bezalel and Aholiab to do certain things, to be sort of the, the uh, supervisors, if you will, for the project. But then he called other people as well. He didn't just call the 
project managers or the project supervisors, he called other people as well. In verse 25 of chapter 35, it says, all the women who were gifted artisans, and keep that in mind, gifted artisans, spun yarn with their hands and brought what they had spun of the blue, purple, and scarlet and fine linen. And all the women whose hearts stirred with wisdom spun yarn of goat's hair. There's what that goat's hair was for that they had when they collected things. And maybe they got the goat's hair from um, uh, the Egyptians, possibly, maybe because it was actually probably a much needed commodity. I did a little bit of checking into that. And I asked before, where did all those tents come from? Tents in those days were made from goat's hair. They would spin the yarn, the goat's hair, into yarn, in the strands of yarn. Then they would weave the yarn together, and they made panels maybe 24 inches wide or something like that, out of that uh, panel of goat's hair. And then they would uh, string maybe however many you needed to, uh, for however wide you wanted your tent to be. You, you uh, threaded those together and then you could make a tent. Now, the interesting thing about goat's hair that I, that I found interesting, the Bedouins of today, and there are still nomadic Bedouins in the Middle East and in North Africa, and they still do that. They still make tents out of goat's hair, and they call them houses of hair, which is not the, the most inviting sounding place to live. But believe it or not, those goat's hair tents are very efficient. They're a little bit tighter than a screen, but they leave a little bit of uh, sunlight in, and they leave air through it. So that if you are building a fire and you have the, the fires were usually at the tent door, and you re might remember uh, Abraham and Sarah at the tent door of their tent when the... Um, Angels came to talk to him, and Sarah laughed because she didn't think she would have a, a child at the age of 90 and so on. Well, they'd have a fi the fires were in the doors of the tents. It was porous enough to where the smoke would go through the tent hair, and it would filter out. In the summer, it kept air movement because constantly air was constantly moving um, because it was shaded so it was cooler and then any of the warm air would rise and, and escape. It could escape un, unlike man, most tents of today, it didn't get trapped in there. It would uh, it create a little bit of air movement, it kept you cooler, kept the inside of the tent cooler. Now I know what you're, you're thinking. What happens when it rains? Now it doesn't rain as much there, but it does rain. Funny thing about it is, when it rains, the goat's hair swells, tightens up, and it becomes pretty much waterproof. So it works in both winter, summer, rain, and sunshine. And they were pretty, pretty clever. They must have made those tents long before they headed out into the, into the um, wilderness. And I'm guessing these women that we're talking about here the women that were, that, whose hearts stirred with wisdom spun yarn of goat's hair. I'm guessing that that's what they did. They learned how to do that. They were, as it says in verse 25, gifted artisans that spun yarn. Now, those gifted artisans didn't just happen overnight. They must have taken their work pretty seriously. The indication is here because it says all the women whose hearts stirred with wisdom was that not everybody did that not everybody's heart was stirred with wisdom some were and some weren't it was a little bit like the people in matthew 5 which we'll get back to in a minute but they must have learned how to make this uh, the goat's hair tents which is what they made if you if you kept on reading yeah, it would tell you 
in verse 14 of chapter 36. And we, it's just across the page. They made curtains of goat's hair for the tent, it says, or for the tent over the tabernacle. And they made, said they made curtains which were paneled, and then they fastened the curtains together and made the tent that way, the same way as they normally did for smaller tents. But all that, the tabernacle and all those little tabernacles or tents that you see, that I see in my picture in my wall, were probably made by these same women, but before they got out there. And that's, that's the key to the story, is the fact that they had practice before the big job. They were called to do this, but they were not just called haphazardly. They were already prepared. They already knew how to do it because, as it said, all the women whose hearts stirred with wisdom spun yarn of goat's hair. They already had practice. They, it wasn't like they were jumping into this just out of the blue with no experience because they weren't. God gifted them with talent, with the talent to spin yarn. And it says so, that the, they had the wisdom and spun yarn. God provided the people he needed to do the job when he needed them. We can think of that in the church, in our life now. We can apply that same principle because the time to do all those things, learn all those things, is before we're required to do it to develop and hone our skills at that point. Let's go back to Matthew, the 25th chapter. Matthew 25. In Matthew 25, uh, we saw where this, this uh, man traveling to a far country had called his servants, delivered his goods, and the, the, one of the keys, he gave to each according to his ability. That's what he did back in the wilderness, too. He gave according to their ability. Some people were good at one thing. Some people were good at some, something else. So God gave them gifts and talents to coincide with the things that they were, had an aptitude for or ability. Verse 16, the one who received five talents went and traded and made another five talents. Verse 18, who had re he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. He didn't think it was important to develop his talent. He didn't think that it was important that he try to continue to grow. He didn't think it was important that what that little bit that he has, let's just put it, just keep it there and, and uh, uh, be able to give it back when the man returns. Well, we know what happened to him in verse uh, 21. His Lord said to him, the one who had received, or five, he said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You, are, you were faithful over a few things. I will make you rule over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Then in verse 26, he's talking to the one who just had one and decided to hide it. it. says, you wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. You ought to have at least invested so that it would grow a little bit, but you didn't. And we know what, what um, happened there. All indications, as I said, were about the women that whose heart stirred them with wisdom to spin yarn, all of them took it seriously. But it indicates by the fact that it says all whose heart stirred them that some of them did not take it seriously, T did not take their work seriously. It was too difficult, too unimportant. In the hot sun, making tents, spinning goat's hair, weaving goat's hair, and making tent panels for tents just didn't seem to be uh, good enough or important enough for some of them. But for the, the uh, others, it did. And when the important job came along, 
they were ready for it. There's a, another extraordinary example, and I'll go through it quickly because I'm running out of time, but there's another extraordinary example of developing talent. In 1880, a little girl was born in Tuscumbia, Alabama, and she was a very bright girl. She was very cheerful, and she was very um, energetic, and she learned to walk quickly and to talk very, very quickly, and, and pretty soon she was hanging on to her mom's coattails or, or uh, skirt tails, and wherever mom went, she went. But when she was two years old, she got sick, and she developed a fever, a pretty serious one, as a matter of fact. And finally, she got, little by little, she got over it. But her mom noticed something different about her because she'd been able to talk. She wasn't talking. She, when her mom came into the room, the, the little girl didn't seem to be aware of it. When her mom got up to the crib, it didn't seem like her eyes were following her mom. And pretty soon she discovered that she was blind. And she wasn't just blind, but she was also deaf. She couldn't hear, she couldn't see, and she couldn't speak. She became frustrated and angry, and she became manipul manipulative, and she threw a lot of tantrums because she was trapped in a dark, silent world from which there seemed to be no escape. And you would, you would wonder how in the world you could ever reach a person like that. If you can't see and you can't hear, that's a pretty big handicap in life. It's pretty hard to deal with and pretty hard to go forward with that. And Helen Keller probably would have given up and just spent her life in that dark, dreary world. But a, a lady came along. They took her to every... Uh, place they could imagine to try to find out and see if they couldn't get her to uh, her sight back and her hearing back and so forth to no avail. And then they took her to some schools to see if they could get some training for her. Nobody really wanted to deal with it. But then they took her to one school and the guy at the school said, I think I might have somebody that could help you. And a girl, she was 20 years old, and this was when Helen Keller was seven years old, and yes, Helen Keller was the, the, the blind and deaf girl. When she was seven years old, they found somebody to help her, and the girl's name was, she was 20 years old, and her name was Annie Sullivan. And Annie Sullivan realized quickly that there is talent in this child, that she is bright, she is gifted, and she has a lot to offer, if only we can figure out a way to get it to the surface. If only we can figure out a way for her to become more sensitized or, or for her to be able to express herself. That was the challenge. She had, and Annie Sullivan knew this and decided to concentrate on this, she had three senses left of the five. She couldn't see and she couldn't hear, but she could smell, she could taste, and she could touch. So that's what Annie Sullivan started using. She had a little doll that she, Helen did, that she played with and she liked to play with. So Annie would take the doll and she would spell doll in her, on her palm, the palm of her hand. But she couldn't figure out what that was. She could repeat it back to uh, Annie pretty soon, Helen could, but she couldn't figure out what it meant or what it was. And then Annie decided that, you know what, her parents and her household is enabling her. We have to get her out of here, get her somewhere else and isolate her. Then we can use these things and start doing these things and she can learn. So they moved, she moved away. Uh, she actually, 
sort of tricked her. She just moved on another house on the property, but they went about 10 miles running around pretending they were going somewhere and came back and, and they had changed the furniture around in this house and so forth and went to that house. And when she was by herself with Helen, she started making progress. In about three months, she could spell doll back to her and know what it meant, that it meant that little doll. She liked cake, so she did the same thing with cake. It took them about three months just to take those first tiny little steps. For her to become fully conversant, or as much as could, can be possible in a blind and a deaf person, it took years to do that. But by the time she was 14, she was really beginning to be able to express herself. She was beginning to be able to do a lot of things. She entered school. She was perhaps the brightest child in the school. She graduated from college, uh, from Radcliffe, which is a, is a pretty prestigious college. She graduated with honors from that college. She met presidents, she met people, famous people like Alexander Graham Bell, and she interacted with a lot of people. She wrote three books, and she ended up helping the blind. She went to work for the American Society for the Blind to help other people with her experiences so that she could so that she could be productive and so that she could, other people could learn from what she had done. She was a big asset. She lived till 19, I believe 68. She was born in 1880. She had a long and productive life. And it was because Annie Sullivan teamed up with her and helped her to develop the gifts and talents that she had, that she did not have to stay in that dark, silent world that she was, she wasn't born into it, but that she fell into at the age of two. And she grew away from that anger and the frustration that she had because now she had a life. She developed what she had under some of the most horrific circumstances that we could think of in terms of, it, it to be blind and deaf would be pretty devastating and pretty hard to get past. But she did, with determination and with hard work. She developed her talent. As Matthew 25, 15 says, to each according to his ability. We have been given gifts each according to our ability. We've been given many gifts and blessings. We won't go to 1 Corinthians 12, but if uh, jot that down and, and take a, take a uh, trip through 1 Corinthians, uh, the 12th chapter, and, talk, and see about the spiritual gifts that God has given. And back in Romans, the 12th chapter, we'll just real quickly look at that, Romans 12, and finish sort of what we started. It says, having gifts then, in verse 6, differing according to the grace that is given us, let us use them. Let us use them, the gifts that we have been given, the, according to the grace that is given to us. If it's prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean prophecy in terms of foretelling. Maybe it means, it can mean uh, preaching or speaking and so forth. It doesn't just have to mean foretelling the future. Um, and I know, sometimes I think, why do I, why do I have to spend all this time preparing a sermon? You know, and then I think, well, if I've been given something to do, then I probably better should do it. And I know that maybe we have the same, uh, some of the same feelings about things. Verse 7, or if it's ministry, which means uh, service. It doesn't mean to be a minister necessarily, but it means service. Let us use our serving. Let's do it. Let's serve if that's the gift we've been given. If it's teaching, and some te people are very apt teachers. They're very good at it. 
Not everybody is, but some people have that gift. That's what we should do. If it's encouraging or exhorting, let's do that in our exhortation. He who gives with liberality. In other words, what it means is when we, if we can give, if we're in a blessed, it says that giving or um, giving is more blessed than receiving. And that's because we're in a position where we can do that, and the person receiving generally is not. So it is more blessed to be able to give than to receive. But if that is our gift, if we can give, if we have, to have the resources to give, it means don't do it for a reward. Do it with a single purpose in mind to help and not to help ourselves. He who leads with diligence. If we're in a leadership position, then we should do it with diligence. We should learn to work with people better. We should enhance that particular talent and gift. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Now that mercy, what's, what it means here, it's not uh, forgiving somebody something. It's helping people who are sick, disabled, maybe visiting people, and so on, do it with cheerfulness. I know sometimes it, we get tired of it. But still, we need to, if that's what we've been given, if that's the gift we have, if that's what we've been given by God to do, then we need to, need to do it with cheerfulness. And that's not always easy. There are many other gifts. Uh, the uh, first, or chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians lists the, number of other gifts as well. But people like Pete Rose, Nadia Kamenichi, they spent hours developing their gifts and their talents. They spent thousands of hours. Michelangelo, he learned to paint on his back because he had to, it took him four years of painting on his back. I've talked to people who have been to Sistine Chapel and seen it, and they weren't as impressed with the painting itself as with the detail and the fact of how could you do that lying on your back, painting above your head. Leonardo da Vinci, these are the people we mentioned in the beginning, he spent years sitting by the waterfalls and rippling streams so he could figure out how to paint motion. So he could figure out how, how, what it looks like on canvas, how motion could be depicted in a, in a painting. Remington, Frederick Remington, the Western uh, cowboy uh, uh, artist. He spent years studying still photos of horses running to learn how to paint horses running. Because when he started painting, a horse running was with his feet out the front, two feet out the back, sort of suspended in midair. That was a picture of a horse running at that time. But he learned how to make it look like the horses were running. And when you look at his pictures, you can almost taste the dust because it's realistic. It's, he does a great job. People like Doc Watson spent hours and hours and hours learning to do what he did. He's a, he uses a technique called cross picking, which is like a banjo except it's with a flat pick. And it, it's, a, it's a tremendous, I've tried it. and failed. The, the girl playing the, the Stradivarius violin, she spent hours and hours and hours upon hours practicing. Helen Keller and Annie Sullivan, they practiced forever before they actually got to the place where they really could help each other. And they really could, where Helen Keller, Annie Sullivan got Helen Keller to be able to express herself. And it manifested itself in books and all kinds of things. The gifted artisans of um, those ladies that were spinning the yarn, they could have sat in the heat and said, no, it's, uh, this is too much for me. I don't want to do it. But was making goat hair tents unimportant? Obviously, it was not. God had a purpose and a reason for it. A dormant gift or dormant unused talent is useless. It's not worth anything. 
We, the called, if we're called, we are also the gifted. God has given us gifts in preparation for his kingdom. We're preparing for the Feast of Tabernacles and also for the, the kingdom of God right now. We should keep those tabernacles in the, in the wilderness and these experiences in mind as we go forward. We should think about those when things start, you know, we wish we, well, why do I have to do this? Because we're developing our talent. Let's go back to where we started, 1 Corinthians 1.26, for our final scripture. 1 Corinthians 1.26. Again, he said, For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. God has called the foolish things of the world for a reason, to put to shame the wise. God has call, chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things or the insignificant things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen, and the things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are. That's our job. That's our job. We are working towards the kingdom of God. That no flesh, he has chosen these things, that no flesh should glory in his presence. It's not us. It's God in us that does the work. We develop the talents that God has given us. But it's not us. We need to give God the glory. God has a purpose for giving us these talents. He has a reason for it. There's going to be a, a place for us to apply these things, whether now, which we are, are supposed to be applying them now, or in the future. God did not call the gifted. God gifted the called. He did not call the gifted. He gifted the called. So according to the grace that we have been given, that have been given to us, let us use those gifts. 